17 in the front of the Bible song. Okay. 17 in the front of the Bible song. selection. Uh, that's uh, another one of my favorite Bible songs. Of course, I have a list of about 50. I think they're my favorite Bible songs, but that's definitely high up there. Uh, so thank you, ma'am. Well, tonight, uh, for our scripture reading and for our teaching time, we're going to start out in the book of Isaiah, and we're going to start in Isaiah 66, uh, verse 5. We're going to read through verse 13. Now, just as a reminder, uh, this is our uh, last uh, you know, a lesson on Tulip. Right? We started out back in February, I think it was, uh, with total depravity, right? And then we learned about unconditional election, and then limited atonement, and then irresistible grace, and now we've been looking at perseverance of the saints over the summer. And so when we come back to evening worship on the 7th of August, uh, we'll start something new. So if you have an idea of uh, a subject or a book or, or something like that that you'd like to hear more about. I'm certainly open to just about anything, so uh, just let me know, and we'll definitely uh, get working on that. But like I said, tonight we're in our last uh, part four of Perseverance of Saints, and last time we were together, we talked about hell, and so I thought it would be best to end our time on something positive, so we're going to talk about the doctrine of heaven uh, today. And to do that, like I said, we're going to start out here in Isaiah 66. So let's go ahead and go there in uh, the Lord's time. So Isaiah 66, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake. Said that the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they should be ashamed. The sound of noise in the city, a voice in the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, who caused delivery, shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem. And be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, and all you who mourn for her, that you may be, be, feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her side, shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you should be comforted in Jerusalem. Amen. So here in Isaiah 66, 
uh, we have a promise from the Lord. And the promise is, is that in the future, the Lord is going to vindicate Zion. He is going to make right that which is wrong. And of course, we know that this takes place in and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who comes, and of course, Christ is the one who is born. There is a sense here, of course, of birth being new life. When we think of the beginning of the world, we hear that Eve is given the name Eve because she is the mother of all living. She is the one who gives birth to uh, the first human beings born of the flesh. You know, one of those, we talked about this one night, but you know, there's always this big question whether or not Adam and Eve had a belly button. And, you know, we can uh, decide that tonight if you'd like. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what, what makes you think Adam and Eve would have a belly button? Well, why not? <laughs> well, yeah, God could have given them one, couldn't he? He could <laughs> Right? Well, again, it's one of these questions we ask sometimes, which really isn't that important, but it's kind of fun to argue about. But the idea is, right, that Eve is the creator of life, right? She is the one who bears the first children. And, of course, we understand that when she bore children, part of the curse is what, should we, what would she feel? Pain, that's right. I'm glad Owen was the first one to <laughs> say that, right? The, that pain would come from childbirth. But what was the promise of the future? Right, that out of her seed would come the Lord Jesus, right? Who would put an end to death, would put an end to the rule of the evil one. And the promise there is, is that there would be a day where there would be birth with no pain. It would be a return back to the uh, life as it existed in the garden. Now, when we think about that, right, do we still experience pain in childbirth? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. right? And why do we still experience pain in childbirth? Right, because we live in a simple world, right? The, even though Jesus has come and we testify that Christ is the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament, we are also with the understanding that he is making all things new, right? And there will be a day to come when all things will be perfected. Now, when we think about childbirth and we think about, again, the image here, right, we're meant to understand that this isn't literally the case that in the future you're going to give birth and not have pain. The idea here is, is that out of the new birth, out of the new life that is given through Jesus Christ, that in the day of fulfillment, that there will be no pain. Right? There will be no uh, problems. Right? There will be no trouble uh, with life. And we're told in the scriptures that when is that time going to be? And when Jesus comes the second time, right? When Jesus comes the second time, he's going to glorify right, all those whom he has been making ready for his second coming. Right? So one of the things we've talked about throughout TULIP has been the idea, right, that we are dead in sin, that God has called us from before the foundation world to be his, that there is nothing we do right, to earn that place in the kingdom. It is purely by the shed blood of the Lamb, right? The righteousness imputed by faith. And that faith which we receive, right, we've heard in perseverance, will not be taken away from us. Because at the foundation of everything that we believe about salvation is the fact that God has done it all. Right? And if God has made a promise to us, is it ever going to change? No, right? The reason why we use the language of of uh, John 3.16 is because when the promise says eternal life, well, how long is, is that? Right, forever. Right? If God gives you eternal life, it's not a temporary thing, right? It's a permanent thing. And so our focus in the perseverance of the saints, as we've talked about before, is the heavenly places which are to come. 
We, we walk as pilgrims on the way, right? The wilderness journey is an important picture for us. And eventually we're going to get to the promised land. But unlike the Israelites, do we have to worry about offending God and being kicked out of the promised land? No, right? Because the promises are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. And so as we go to heaven and as we think about heaven, you know, one of the first things that we probably need to think about is today, mine, it, does heaven exist right now? Yes, right? Heaven exists right now. And one of the reasons why we know heaven exists right now is because of what Jesus says to the thief on the cross. Remember, you know, there's two thieves on the cross, right? One on Jesus' left and one on Jesus' right. Now, when Jesus first gets there, what do both of the thieves do? Mock him, Mock him revile him, say things like, if you're truly God, if you're truly the Son of God, Get yourself off the cross. You know, the same kind of things the Roman soldiers and the Pharisees and the other Jews were saying. However, in the midst of all this, one of the, one of the criminals is convicted by the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? And the criminal says unto the other criminal, uh, the one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Are we, and we indeed justly receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? So we know that heaven exists today because the, the, the thief on the cross had to go somewhere. Right? And we hear it called paradise here. Now, you know, this is one of the places where we diverge from you know, other religions when it comes to the idea of heaven. You know, almost everybody, every religion has an idea of an afterlife that is a place of joy and a place of, 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 of freedom and of liberty and all these things. The difference between the Christian faith and the, the Muslim faith, for example, is what do you get to do in heaven if you're a Muslim? Right? All the stuff that you're not allowed to do here. Right. It is basically a flesh-filled, you know, wonderland. Right. You, know, you remember when, well, y'all don't remember this, but uh, you remember when, you know, 9-11 happened and, you know, one of the big things that people talked about for many months afterwards was the idea that the, uh, the Islamic terrorists were doing this so that they could go to heaven, right? One of the things they would get in heaven was 72 virgins, right? The idea that they could flourish and have all these things that they were denied here on the earth. Well, that's not how the Christian heaven operates, right? We don't believe that heaven is a place where we get to sin and sin boldly. On the other hand, we believe that heaven is a place where we go and we worship the Lord our God. Right? We experience the presence of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. You know, the, this morning... You know, I, at the benediction, I read from the book of Revelation. And you remember, what are the 24 elders doing? Worshiping, Worshiping right? They're bowing down for the Lord, crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, right? And we, we hear, you know, what do they have in their hands? A harp, right? You know, and, and what do you do with a harp? You play it, right? It's an instrument. Well, you think about the Psalms and how many times in the Psalms we hear the psalmist talk about the harp, right? And the trumpet and the, the sound of joy that comes from musical instruments, right? And I think all of us can testify that musical instruments make us happy, right? You know, there's music that we listen to, especially, especially when we're feeling sad, right? There's music we like to listen to. And what does that music do for us? Makes us happy, right? Lifts us up, right? It encourages us. It, you know, it, it gives joy to us. You know, one of the things I like to do when I'm not feeling, uh, you know, up to par is I like to listen to, uh, you know, the the, the Carter uh, family, right? And, you know, uh, June Carter Cash's grandparents, right? The old timey Appalachian, you know, hill music, right? Because there's something about that that makes me feel better. Maybe it makes me think of home and all that stuff, but it just lifts up my spirits. Well, you know, 
everybody, all of us can testify to something we like to listen to. Well, there's a reason why music plays such an important part of life in heaven. Right? Because God has made us to enjoy music and enjoy the things of the Lord. You know, it's one of the reasons why we sing, right, in worship. Right? We sing in order to show forth our thanksgiving to the Lord, but also to praise the Lord, right? You know, that's why we're supposed to sing with, with, with volume, right, and with, with excitement, right? Because we're talking to God in a unique way, right, through our voices and through the testimony of the Spirit. And so paradise is a, is, is a real place. Now, the next question is, is at this point in time, is heaven a physical place? Does it like take up space in the universe? No. <laughs> I will say yes. Yes, it does, right? It, and, and why do we know that heaven is a physical place? Anybody have an idea? That's right. God, you know, Jesus, right, what did he do? You know, in Acts chapter 1. Ascended into heaven, right? Now, you remember at the end of the Gospel of John, right? What does Thomas do? Sticks his finger in his side, right? You know, it's one of the creepier parts of the Bible. But Simon just sticks his finger in Jesus' side, right? Testifying that what did Jesus have? A physical, A physical real body, right? That he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't an apparition. He wasn't... A hologram, right? He was a real physical human being. And so when he ascends into heaven, think about who's already there. God. Well, God's there, but God doesn't have a body. You know, go back way back to the early parts of the book of Genesis. We hear of Enoch, right? Does Enoch die? No, right? He is brought into heaven. Well, we think of Elijah, right? You know, did Elijah die? Uh, he was taken by a chariot into heaven. So there's at least three right, people up there who have physical bodies, right? And we believe that Jesus' body is a real body. So if it's a real body, what's it affected by? Right? Physics, right? So gravity has to exist in heaven, right? You know, oxygen has to exist in heaven, or at least in the sense we understand that, right? I, I'm not 100% sure if we're going to be breathing oxygen in the new heavens, new earth, but... You know, the, the concept there is, right, that heaven's a physical place. Now, the next question is, is where is it? Where God is, right? Well, you know, obviously there's a couple ideas here. You know, heaven could be in, the, in, in outer space somewhere, right? You know, you know, it might be one of those black hole thingies that we can't see through. Well, what is the, let me ask you this question. What does the Bible tell us about where heaven is? Kind of a trick question. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about where heaven is, right? So, on, on one hand, right, this is one of these Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine questions, right? Right, the secret things belong unto the Lord, right? If God wanted us to know where heaven was, what would He have done? He told, told us, right? Now, you know, I happen to believe that heaven is is you know at present, right, the the Garden of Eden, you know, because you remember when. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, right? What happened to the garden? Nothing, right? You know, why, why, why can't we go back in the garden? Right? Remember, there's, there's big angels standing out front of there with swords of fire, right? So, has, has anybody ever seen these big swords of fire? No, right? So, it's one of these things that the Lord has providentially, in his wisdom, hidden from our view, right? And there's things that we cannot see. You know, we think of the, you know, the, the, uh, the chariots around the army, the Assyrian army, right? Remember, they're there, right? But the servant can't see them. And so Elisha asks God to open his eyes, and he opens his eyes, and what does he see? Right? All the chariots. They exist, they're there. And like the angels, right? We believe that there's angels around us right now, right? At this very second. But we can't see them, right? Because we don't have eyes to see that they're around us, right? So heaven is a physical place, it's a real place, and it's somewhere that exists, right? Jesus in his physical body is present there. And he's present there doing what? That's right. You know, he's interceding for us. 
You know, he is ruling from there, right? You know, that's what we say in the Apostles' Creed, right? That, you know, Christ is risen, you know, ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, you know, judging the quick and the dead, right? Well, so we know that about heaven, right? It's a physical place. It's a real place where people actually are. So when you die, where do you go? To heaven, right? Now, you go there as a, your soul, right, goes to heaven. So the, the thief on the cross, right? What happens to his body after he dies? Well, well, the thief was probably thrown in the, in the refuse heap, right, with all the other criminals. Um, but, right, his soul immediately goes into heaven, right? So, you know, the, the souls of the path of those who have died are in heaven right now, right? And they are, what, what are the souls in heaven waiting for? The second coming, right? When the second coming takes place, the scriptures tell us that our bodies will rise out of the graves, right? So all the graves out here at Bethany are all going to open up, right? They're, and they're going to open up, and the physical bodies that are in the graves are going to come out of the graves. And as this is happening, what is happening to those souls that are in heaven? Right? They are coming with Jesus, Right? With the great trumpet shout, right, the souls are coming with Jesus, and, you know, they, you know, for lack of better saying this, re-inhabit, right, the bodies of, you know, their bodies, wherever they might be. Now, what do we do with people who were buried at sea? How, how is God going to raise them from the dead? Or people who were destroyed in explosions or in fires or things like that? Right. Well, you know, you know, they, they don't, you know, this is going to sound weird, right? But their the molecules don't cease to exist, right? You know, they're broken down, obviously. But the, the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, right, the sea is going to give up her dead, right? And the same thing with anybody else whose bodies, for whatever providential reason, were, you know, taken apart, you know, at death. And so we have a promise there, again, that while ordinarily, right, we bury the dead as a sign of the resurrection, right, we do believe that if something extraordinary takes place, that God's still able, right, to raise them from the dead. Now, you know, that's part of, you know, the, the blessings, again, of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our catechism tells us that even in death, our bodies remain united to Christ by faith. You know, our physical bodies remain. And what's important about that is this idea that, that again, that the body is as important to God as the soul. Right? You know, there's an old heresy called Gnosticism that teaches that, you know, the body is bad, right? Flesh is evil. Flesh is, you know, destructive. And so what death is is freedom from this prison that the soul is stuck in. Right? But we don't believe that, Right? The reason why we take care of our bodies is because we believe they're important to the Lord. And part of the reason why they're important to the Lord, again, is because we believe in heaven. We believe that in the future, right, that heaven is going to go from one place to another. So in the scriptures, we're told that in the future, that when Jesus returns, uh, where is heaven going to go? Right, it's going to follow him in a sense, right? You know, not that Jesus has like heaven in a big U-Haul or something and is going to move it down here, right? But heaven is going to relocate to the physical earth that God has made. Right? That's one of those questions, of course, we have about aliens and things like that, right? You know, I happen to believe that we're never going to find uh, intelligent life on other planets and on other um you know, solar systems and the like. And the reason for that is, is because how many intelligent creatures has the Lord made? One, right? And who, who are the only intelligent creatures? We are, right? Human beings. And where did God put human beings? On the earth, right? And every scientist under heaven, whether he's a believer, an unbeliever, a violent atheist, doesn't matter. One of the things that they all say about Earth is that it is unique. 
If earth was one inch further out into space, what would happen to us? We'd all freeze to death, right? If, if earth is, was one inch closer to the sun, what would happen to us? We'd burn up, right? But we're perfectly located within the solar system. And of course, the rotation that we have around the sun is perfect so that, you know, that we have, right, the changes in the years, right? We have the seasons and temperate zones in the world so that everything is able to sustain life. Well, in the future, right, when heaven returns, as we hear in Revelation 21, 1, right, now I saw new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I talked about this morning in Sabbath school. You know, this picture here of heaven descending upon the earth. So after Jesus returns, after the great white throne judgment and all of the, all of the goats, all of the reprobate are cast into hell, you know, where are we going to live? Right here, right? Not necessarily here, you know, Clover, South Carolina, but right, we're going to live here on earth. The whole of earth is going to be in, in Eden. But it's going to be far better than Eden. Right? Eden is a wonderful place, and I'd much rather live in Eden, right? Because there's no death, no sin, none of that, right? But heaven is better than Eden. And that's one of the things the Bible teaches us about the purpose of God in his plan. Is that you know, we're not returning back to the way things were. We're re going to somewhere better. And that's always been part of God's providential plan is that we were going to go from Eden to heaven. So if Adam had obeyed in the garden, guess what would have happened? God would have said, well done, good and faithful serpent, ser servant, uh, oh, you, a Freudian slip there, uh, <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant, and you know everything would have been made you know, perfect. right? And so heaven, right, it goes from a place wherever it is, to earth and all of earth becomes heaven. And how long are we going to be in this new Jerusalem, this new heaven? Forever, right? And there will never be a time where God will say, well, let's, let's see what happens if I reintroduce sin amongst all these glorified people. Right? That's not going to happen. Right? Because you know, what has Jesus done? He has destroyed sin and death, right? And the second coming is the, the, the culmination of all that. And we'll kind of close on that, but, you know, any, any questions about heaven? Well, see, I, you know, the scriptures don't tell us explicitly on this front, but, I, you know, one of the things we see in Romans chapter 8 Oh, if, where the animals are going to be. They're going to be animals in heaven. Um, you know, in, in Romans chapter 8, one of the things it says there is that the creation groans under the weight of sin, right? And so the creation is groaning under the weight of sin. And one of the things it says there is that Jesus is going to redeem the earth, right? He is going to repair all of the transgressions. And of course, in the book of Isaiah, we hear, uh, you know, the, the testimony about the lion and the lamb. And so in the new heavens and new earth, what's the lamb and lion going to be able to do? Lie down together. And why can't lions and lambs lay down together today? That's right. The lion would eat the lamb, right? And, but in the new heavens and new earth, there's no death. There's no blood. There's no destruction. And so, yes. You know, I believe the scriptures teach there will be animals in, in, in heaven. Right? Because they're a part of God's good creation as much as, as we are. Yes, ma'am. Is heaven in the sky or is it like in the Well, yeah, I, I think that, you know, yeah, again, so we need to be careful sometimes not to read too much into the Bible. But, you know, where does Jesus ascend to? Right, but w which way does he go? Up. up, right? So it makes sense, right, following that logic that heaven's up there somewhere. Yeah, so it's up there somewhere, but we can't see, right? God has hidden it from our vision.
Right? Other questions on on heaven and what life's gonna be like here. Now, one one thing: Are we gonna get wings when we go to heaven? No, no right? Right? We don't get wings, right? Because we don't become angels. You know, Jesus, or, well, Jesus, uh, Paul in Hebrews chapter two is abundantly clear that we don't become angels when we die because we're better than angels, right? So to become an angel would be actually to take a step down, right? Um, and we're not flying around, you know, in the clouds and all that kind of stuff, right? Strumming our, our uh, harps and our lyres and all that stuff. Now, we are going to have harps and stuff, right? So if you've learned how to play that now, I guess that'll be an advantage when you get up there. But, right, the idea is, is that you are going to be, right, <laughs> worshiping the Lord. Yes, sir. Well, n not all of them are eyeballs with wings. Uh, well, you, you know, you're thinking of uh, the angel as he's described in Ezekiel chapter 1, right? Because he you know, has eight wings, right? And it's covering all the eye eyeballs and stuff that he has. Right? But some angels, right, have the body of a man, right? For lack of a way of saying it. Now, does that mean angels are actually you know, men with wings? No, right? They appear in that way. Right, as to not startle us too much, but you know, to to interact with us and the like. Right. Other other questions? God hasn't created any more angels. That's right, and God hadn't made any more angels, right? You know, when He created them from before He created us, um, and you know, there are elect angels and there's reprobate angels, and. You know, they are not, that's one of the reasons, not to get off on a whole other subject, but that's one of the reasons why in Genesis 6, we're not to understand that the sons of God are angels. These angels don't have the ability to procreate, right? They don't have the ability to make children. Um, so they couldn't have made children with the daughters of men because they don't work like that. Oh, you have another one? That's all right. The question is, is uh, do we eat in heaven? Well, yeah, I, I don't think there's going to be any eating in heaven. And the reason is, is because what, why do we eat? Right? We need nutrients. We need, right, to, to grow strong, right? We need to take care of our bodies. Well, you know, in heaven, is there going to be a need to take in nutrients? No, right? So we're, we're, we're not going to, at least, again, the Lord can prove me wrong, <laughs> but uh, I I don't think there's any biblical evidence that we'll eat in heaven. Right. One more. Well, you mean like uh, yeah? Let's say that you die when, when you're. We will be in the form of what, uh, what we were when we died. Right. So the the question really is is. You know, let's say you die when you're 89 years old, right? Is that what you're going to look like when you are raised from the dead? And, you know, the, the, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible does tell us that we're going to be perfected. So, for instance, let's say that, you know, at some point in time in the future, you lose a leg, right? And you only have one leg. Well, when you're raised from the dead, how many legs are you going to have? Two, right? You know, so any physical abnormalities or anything like that is going to be healed, you know, in the glorified body. Now, whether or not we're going to be 25 years old and be in good physical condition, and all that kind of stuff, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us. You know, and again, you know, another question that comes out of that is, you know, will we know people in heaven, right? <coughs> you know, I mean, that's often, that's a question people ask all the time. You know, will, will I know so-and-so in heaven? And I think the scriptures tell us that yes, you know, you will recognize other saints in heaven. Right? Does that mean you're going to, you know, have to get in a line to talk to Jesus or get in a line to talk to other people? Well, no, right? That, that's not how heaven is going to work, right? We're not going to have to sit and wait in line <laughs> in heaven. Um, that's a function of, uh, of sin, I think. Uh, yes, ma'am.
Well, we'll, we'll you know, we're not going to start over as babies. No, we, we don't grow in heaven. Right? So we're going to, whatever form and age we are when we are glorified, we're going to be that age, that shape or whatever for all of eternity. So that's one of the reasons why we don't eat, right? Because we don't need to get stronger. We don't need to grow and all that kind of stuff. Well, we can go ahead and close on that, but uh, I don't know what I'd do with my bulletin. <laughs> um, it, got, it got eaten by my Bible, I think. Right, do you have one? There. <coughs> I don't know what I did with it. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for the time you give to us to study your word, to uh, you know, consider many different uh, uh, questions about uh, what life is going to be like in heaven. Uh, but to God, we give thanks again that the promise we've received in you is uh, full of truth and of certainty and of assurance. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our benediction tonight comes to us from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. So we'll go ahead and close uh, with that. 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Verse 58. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen.